Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the recording of Search Marketing Scoop episode number four. So we are going to be rocking and rolling, starting the episode recording going pretty soon. Um, we're getting we're getting branded now. You know, I, I want to point want to point out this first of all. Look at look at this. <laughs> Search <laughs> going pro. Search Marketing Scoop <laughs> taking over the world. Anyway, <laughs> uh, we are broadcasting live on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter, if everything goes is, goes according to plan. So that is great. So for those of you watching live, um, thank you so much for joining in. Uh, I would imagine most of the conversation is going to be on Facebook, so um, possibly viewer towards there if you want to be part of the conversation. But of course, um, grateful for you to be around no matter what platform you happen to be sticking to. Uh, anyway, um, just say a little hi in the chat um, if you can hear us and uh, if you're joining in. So tell us um, where you're joining in from. Um, where in the world do you happen to be at the moment? So um, I will check on the post and click mute as I do that as well. So okay if you bear with me a second. This is the informal introduction. So. Uh, Great stuff. So I can see the comments as they come in. So anyone who has any particular comments in relation to what we're going to discuss about today, please uh, share them on Facebook. Uh, it will be great to hear from you and uh, we'll try and involve, involve you as part of the discussion. But I reckon we're just about ready to start the official recording of the podcast. And I say podcast because it is actually a proper podcast now. Uh, the first three episodes have been submitted to iTunes and approved by iTunes as well. So if you are a proud carrier of an iPhone, then simply go to your podcasts app and search for Search Marketing Scoop inside there and you will see the show inside there. Um, also available for Android as well, SEM Rush will be sending out an email with the exact link to subscribe to on Android, but we're not forgetting about Android um, fans. In fact, I've got a Google Pixel uh, 2XL myself, so um, uh, I've moved from the um, from the dark side or from the light side. I'm not sure. I'll let you uh, <laughs> decide whatever that is. Um, but um, we're getting some people uh, saying hi and joining. Um, um, Nadezda. Uh, has said, um, hi Nadia from Vancouver, lovely city Vancouver, thank you for joining in. Obviously there's a slight delay um, between the video going out and the comments coming back in, but that is only natural, but thank you so much for joining in. We've got um, 13 likes already, which is a very good thing to have. So we are going to start the recording of um, episode four just now, and I've just refrained from introducing the guests until our official introduction here. Um, so let me get uh, my wires lined up here and um, we will start. Google confirms a core algorithm update and then they turn on a single result SERP and then take it away. Google also apparently remove 100 bad ads a second and you'll soon be able to target people on YouTube who recently search for your products or services on Google. Broadcasting live on Facebook, Twitter and YouTube, this is Search Marketing Scoop, the SEO Rush show that brings together the top PPC and SEO folk to discuss the current search headlines and how they impact you. Hi, I'm your host David Bain and today's first guest is someone with over 10 years experience in paid search. She is a popular event speaker and the founder of MindSwan. Welcome to The Scoop, Anu Ad Adigbola. Hi. Hi Anu, uh, thanks for joining us. And guest number two is an account manager in a technical SEO and cybersecurity specialist consultancy. You can find him over at salt.agency. Welcome to The Scoop, Dan Taylor. Hi, David. Hi, Dan. Thank you for joining Hi. us as well. Um, well, let us go back to Anu for story number one, and that is Google removes 100 bad ads a second. So, Anu, that seems like an incredible amount, but is it enough? <laughs> what are your thoughts on this? Um, it's important. It's definitely um, an important um, thing to do. I think I was actually reading that. Uh, about like three, four years ago, it was at about 780 million 
um, ads that they um, take down or disapproved, um, you know, in the year. And um, with that 100 ads a day, that comes up to like 3.2 billion ads um, this year that they take down. And um, it's it's important for, you know, to prevent scams. It's important for a good consumer journey and and to, to make sure that, you know, we are getting the content we want to see. I mean, if we want to do get do links for entertainment. That's why I feel this, the social media is actually for the you know. I mean, we all like to probably tap once in a while during the day. I think that's you know public knowledge now. But you know, when, when we want to search for something and on Google, Dakota UK, and we want you know go to the web to to complete a journey to do a particular action. We don't want to be worried that you know it's it's something that's misleading or we're going to put in our credit card information into a website that that is not not legal um and i was actually even like while i was doing like some research research about this topic i came up to came across a, a podcast of um called reply all and um there was this one topic called um lost in the cab uh, where this company where actually they did a paid search ad that drove people when you search for let's say you lost like your mobile phone or you lost your camera in um a, you know a cab as you're leaving it and you are you know, trying to get into to authorities to try to help you find your camera back and um a lot of people had, had been searching when they've done that search for something um like i say lost my phone in a cab or how do i get my retrieve my possession in a cab and a paid search ad comes up takes you to a website and I let, lets you put in all your details for your phone and stuff, or, or put in your details for what you've lost and how to contact you back, you know, you're putting your phone number. But if you actually look closely in the small print, actually the very small print, like the top right hand corner, it says that they actually aren't going to go about any, you know, active way of actually looking for your product. And you actually have to pay for this service as well to just have your name and number put up on the website. Which I was like, that just everything just sounded dodgy about that. I think even yeah. like the podcast guys, they they contacted um, Search Engine Lands with Jenny Marvin as well to just have her uh, her views on it, and she was just absolutely baffled and horrified that that was going on. And that was someone just using a paid search ad to drive people to their site, even though this was someone taking money for doing nothing. Now, <laughs> I know in terms of policies and ads and what you know how they did the keywords, that's all legal and it's very hard. For Google to monitor something like that, you know, and it does take, you know, people on the website or people on online being, you know, using the initiative and knowing when not to give their details or not. But we would also definitely love to get the help of Google to preventing those ads from showing if it's if it's like definitely. A taking our money for absolutely for, you know, and. Service. These ads obviously have a negative reflection on Google themselves, and I guess yeah. that's what Google will be particularly concerned about. Obviously, they're concerned about the individuals and ensuring that um, the experience of your users on their site effectively is as good as possible. But if it happens to be that um, these users um, end up blaming Google for something negative yeah. that happens to them, that, that's, that's, that's going to be pretty shocking. Um, so 100 ads per second. I'm not sure if to think yeah. whether that's a high volume or uh, not that significant a volume or just something that happens to be PRable. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it does sound like a very good PRable, like, you know, <laughs> word, um, like stats kind of thing. I mean, I love my stats. I feel like the the, the backbone of doing paid search well is like, you know, it's data and, and, and um, making sure you're reading the data properly and giving the consumer what they want based on that. Um, but yeah, it's, I do think, I think what was, I think that, yeah, did Ginny or someone else that did say that it's, it's very much a game of whack-a-mole when Google is trying to stop like a bad, you know, paid ad for being showing. So if um, once they stop like, you know, one or, you know, a hundred of them, there's another hundred that's going to come, come mm. in its place to try mm. to, to, you know, you know, get through the system in another way that that, that Google has not caught them out for. So it's yeah. it's something that it's it's a number that I don't think is too hard. I think it's um I think it's it's if it makes people trust 
a lot better me that you know and all the other paid search people are actually doing the job well yeah then let them keep doing that yeah i think it's google just being you know demonstrating that they're being proactive about controlling the standards and trying to share yeah. with users the fact that they do care about um, the kind of experience that they they happen to have on Google, um, maybe it's yeah. um, it, it it demonstrates that um, although Google are trying their best to ensure the quality of ads and the relevance of ads and um, ensuring that the ad um, is the right type of company they can't do it all themselves and we discussed in last, last week's shows briefly the fact that um, users were getting more choice with the ads that they see on various platforms and perhaps we may even see yeah. users getting more choice on, on the SERP in the future but um, to be honest with you we could probably discuss this for quite a while like just about every single story yeah. that we're <laughs> going to discuss um, but we, I reckon we have to go over to Dan for story number two sure. and that is um, Google have confirmed a core algorithm update so it doesn't make that sort of announcement that often so um, Dan have you gleaned anything from in terms of uh, any sectors that have been badly hit or um, happen to be doing well because of this particular update? I, mean, I think the important thing is to remember it's still a core update. So whilst there are notable drops in games, there's, a number, there's probably a great majority of websites which have come through it and not noticed anything positive or negative other than the general day-to-day -day fluctuations of Google processing things. Um, personally, um, I've seen a number of local um, sites take impacts, especially if they've had uh, poor geographic pages trying to capture other areas, but at the same time, they then come back slightly later on. Um, in the slightly larger sectors that we work with, we noticed in sort of the weeks coming up to the update that there was significant testing going on, um, especially around specific keywords with search volumes of north of 50,000. Um, we were seeing routine testing of dropping and changes of cert layouts and then coinciding with this core album update, we've seen further change based on that. So whilst we are seeing this now, we know that there are some fluctuations happening beforehand and pretty much probably has been confirmed in the update which I've announced. And as you said, they don't announce it very often, but hopefully this is the new process with Danny Sullivan being there, acting as the Google search liaison, but we are going to get slightly more transparency so we don't end up with hundreds of different named algorithms. Um, like We have a Maccabee mm. update in December, which was probably just another quality update, um, just to help us work better with what the actual product is, because another thing I think people misunderstand a lot of the time is Google is never a finished product. Um, we know that the AdWords team don't talk to the search team, but the search team are constantly yeah. tweaking, changing the dials. Um, but yeah. it's just about keeping that consistency and remembering that it is a constantly changing landscape. I mean, years ago, decades ago, when, when I... <laughs> first got involved in SEO, there was the, the Google dance, uh, always looking to see what would happen to your PR, um, to see if um, that would improve. And th th there was a um, Google update every every quarter or so. And then it was a little bit more ad hoc. And then after that, it seemed that Google were moving to not making these big updates, but making these small tweaks every so often. So I think that's why I was more surprised that um, there was a bit of announcement, you know, a, a more of a major update here. Um, is it not the case that, that we should be expecting smaller tweaks um, on a very regular in interval? Or do, do you think in the future we'll still see announcements to say that there has been a major tw a tweak for whatever reason? I think it's fair to expect that they'll always be making tweaks. Um, We've also, uh, I feel with Google, especially like you just said, they've gone from doing the Google Dance quarterly, monthly, and then caffeine obviously helped press speed things up a lot more. Google are very much moving with the times. Um, Penguin, obviously when it was first released, based more frequently, but it became real time two years ago now, I think two years, um, because it got to a point where they didn't need to tweak it anymore because they got the algorithm working, because again, that was a reaction to SEOs. Um, effectively building the game the system. By announcing that they've actually done a major core update, I feel is it's fair 
changing with the times again. That's the reason why they took Danny Sullivan on board to try and have this more transparency as a product, and as a company. Um, the smaller tweaks that they probably make two, three times a week, if not more, I don't expect them to start announcing them. Um, I think like we used to have back in the days of 2012 when we used to do the Webmaster um, blog and list all the code name projects that were updated that month. I think to an extent those days are gone um, because I feel it's now less less not focused on the individual aspects of what makes SEO more points a website, where it's actually now start focused on we know what the core is because ultimately whilst Google doesn't say here's everything that you need to do to rank your website or Rank a, uh, so rank a person web application, but do actually um, tell you how to do everything. Mm. But you just have to go looking for it in maintenance and across all the resources they give you. So we've got quite a few people watching live on, on Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. Um, most are fairly quiet. Um, Andrew Simpson saying um, hi again from New Jersey. So thanks for tuning in again, Andy. Um, it would be good to get um, people's feedback, though. I'm pr- particularly interested in whether people think it's a good idea that um, Google tells people about we've got a big update here and um, it almost goes back to the days of the, the Google dance or if business owners actually prefer there just to be slow, subtle changes on a daily basis, but um, there's not so much of a, a, a song and dance about things. I, I guess SEOs love um, song and dance about things, especially those that happen to discuss them on, on different webinars and podcasts. Um, but um, you could argue that um, if they're just slow and subtle changes, it's not um, so much of um, a negative thing for business because they don't have to, to, to deal with those things. But um, let us move on to story number three, and um, that is you'll soon be able to reach people on YouTube who recently searched for your products or services on Google. So this seems like quite an interesting ad story. Um, Anu, what are your thoughts on this one? I think it's good. Um, that is definitely one of like those like new changes of that that is very much in line with Google trying to make it easier for us to like target different audiences better. This was already being available um, within AdWords for just like general display network. Um, so yeah, it's good that they're bringing that out for YouTube. Um, I was I was actually thinking that like, earlier on because I just like discussing about digital with non-digital people because I feel I, I get some very nice um, interesting insights and um, and I was like you know asking people like what if you like search for something on Google what what are the main things that motivate you to choose a brand from another brand and they were saying like yeah YouTube reviews so when people actually you know just random people take the product and go okay this is a review of the this is a review of the product this is how you use it and I'm thinking that you know I'm thinking that brands could really use that because it's almost like a you know, different branch of views in accelerating, we're accelerating of the ads, which did really well, which really helped with click through rate, conversion rate, because it's a very like trusted, um, you know, kind of thing to see on an ad. Um, so yeah, I think if, if people, if, if brands can really be clever with that, get like, you know, brand uh, champions to do reviews, or, you know, of like the different like products they have or the different services, you know, they offer and integrate that with their, their AdWords and YouTube campaigns. Um, yeah, yeah there's a lot of clever things that could be done. Them. There's, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, you can be very specific about targeting someone who has searched for um, a certain group of keyword phrases and display ads mm. uh, that are video ads on, on, on YouTube targeting those yeah. kind of people. And you can get so specific, but I guess you don't want to be too specific and say, I know you search for this on Google. You should be <laughs> buying yeah. <one." laughs> yeah, yeah, Google, Google. We have to, it's all about, you know, being careful with the content that you put in there because even like with text ads, you start saying that, you know, I know who you are, so I know what this is what you want and yeah. That's where I think Google is very good at, um, you know, blocking those those kind of ads. Mm. So Do you think YouTube's the kind of place that you can get a direct call to action, though? Because, I mean, you generally associate Google search ads as something that you can, you know, bid for a very specific, actionable keyword phrase, get someone to visit your site and be fairly likely that you'll have a decent chance of getting that person to convert and buy something. Do you think you can advertise using video ads on YouTube and expect to get a fairly significant conversion rate from that traffic? Um. I think yes. Um, I've not had extensive um, experience actually using doing YouTube ads. I'll, I'll be honest with that. I've just got like you know I, some interesting views as to you know 
you know, the different strategies mm -hmm. that can be done. But um, I think one thing that's important to know is that, you know, there is a digital consumer journey that happens where a lot of consumers go through different touch points before actually buying and that should not, you know, be downplayed by any point. I think it's very important that to not just necessarily just look at the YouTube specific conversion rate or click through rate, but actually look like how look at how that's has to be helped the whole journey and whether like revenue or conversions and you know volume or and customer retention has happened has improved since that you know the, the youtube ads has been introduced into the customer journey mm. you know because it's all about having a consumer conversion rate and how well you're actually retaining your consumers and not just looking at that what i call to be a very two-dimensional metric of the youtube conversion rate it's not just about the media channels anymore it's about it's about the whole experience that every single touch point yeah. that a user happens to make with your brand. We, we've got Erin Parks exactly. tuning in from Denver. Erin, hi. Thanks for joining us and um, saying hi as well. Um, so you, you're talking about every single touch point um, on the journey there, Anu. Does that mean that um, you perhaps view um, YouTube as a significant retargeting opportunity more than anything else? Yes. Yeah. Yes, definitely. I think it would be really great for retargeting. It was really great for branding as well. So, yeah, in terms of it having its own, you know, a higher conversion rate, it might be probably a lot lower than the the more like direct like links of sending, customer, you know, like paid search ads, text ads that send um, visitors directly to a landing page to buy something right there and then. Um, but again, it's yeah, definitely about the consumer journey. And when I've worked on projects where things have been working that way, there's always been a benefit. It's not just about throwing money on one channel or, or, or just looking at one channel and a silo. I think all the channels work integrated well. Absolutely. Together. Absolutely. I'm going to get a bit more technical in terms of um, getting a specific question here. And uh, I've been looking into retargeting a little bit more recently. And um, there are different options, obviously, with populating for populating retargeting lists. And one way is to do it via Google AdWords and automatically sync that data across to AdWords. Is that the most popular and best way to do it? Or what are your thoughts on that? What do you mean about like populating it through Google Analytics and then syncing it to... Yeah. Adler. Yes, yeah. I mean, I guess there are different ways that you can use to to generate those retargeting lists of of people. And you know, I was I was wondering if most people tended to use Google Analytics to do that, or um, the, the, there are other ways to do that 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 you've used yourself. Um, yeah, I think Google Analytics is definitely a popular popular one, especially for the fact that you know it's very good at, you know, and I get all the data from the website and you get things for different channels and mm. like, own, like attribution solution within there. So yeah, I think that's, uh, that's a very good way to like pull it yeah. in from one place and then using it for different channels. And that's been my biggest experience. I think, uh, I think one of the biggest challenges that um, business owners have is they don't appreciate the fact that they need to set up their sources of data first and get their data flowing before they start doing things. Uh, I think a lot of yeah. businesses or too many businesses, you know, run paid campaigns and don't have adequate tracking or sources of data in place before they, they start to run those campaigns. And I see you nodding away there. So, you... Yes, that is a very like a pain point. I mean, something I've, I've talked about um, quite a few times in like my previous my previous conferences is the evolution of paid search. I mean, when 2002 was all about traffic and just driving traffic and we didn't really care what was going to the site. Right now, it's all about return. You know, it's about how much you're getting for those clicks. But if the tracking is not set up, properly in a wholesome way, in a way that will always be able to track the customer coming to your site. It's, we're, we're, we're working blind. By working blind, we're optimizing against things that it's, it's it, that we, we don't know that's working well. And I always find that like a frustrating part of my job. And sometimes I, I you know, when they, the, 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 a, a client goes, why isn't it working? Tracking, mm. <laughs> just one word, fix your tracking. And you'll, and you'll see the numbers shoot up. <laughs> yeah. And um, Aaron's also saying on Facebook, I agree that looking at all the platforms is important. So obviously, you can't just look at your marketing activity in silo. You need to be thinking about the user journey, hopefully looking at attribution as well to see which sources of traffic tend to refer the highest value traffic as, as, as part of the user journey as well. But um, 
I think we've got to move on to the next subject here, and that is the <laughs> final story going to Dan. So Dan, um, Google um, turned on a single search result and then took a, took it away. So what, what was that all about? To be honest, I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised it's taken them this long to actually experiment this um, out in the wild. Um, the, the type of query it was for, um, I make them myself. Um, I work with clients in various time zones. I can never keep it straight in my head what the time is there. So you Google timing, Washington timing, time of run, anything like that. You look at that top box, you use my calculator, you use the translation widget, that metric. Nine times you don't I've never looked beyond that. And Google will capture and process the data. So the decision to do this will have been data led. They'll have had internal discussions around it. Um, and the fact they've experimented with it and then turned it off means it was an experiment for now. But what we have to understand is the value of those sites appearing underneath that. Um, I know there's quite a lot of screenshots going around on Twitter, um, on LinkedIn, where people had tw uh, actually searched for dates in London and it was bringing up, um, obviously, the time date and then some paid ads for online dating sites. And that's okay, that's great, but they were saying, oh, these sites, this kind of traffic is losing um, because of this change in cert. But when you're actually looking into those queries, they had no search volume. So chances are, um, and, and you can probably agree with me or disagree with me, but they were probably search ads which had a broad match factor to factor for dates and London on them. Um, the actual focus on that query potentially had nothing to do with matchmaking or dating. It was just rogue AdWords ads. So I question the actual value that's been lost by going to that single cert. Um, from Google's perspective, it makes sense because anyone who does rank tracking, anyone who's bought properties to scrape Google before knows it's expensive to scrape the internet. It's expensive to store data. It's expensive to keep servers cool or the electricity that goes into it. If Google can reduce the amount it's got to do for queries where the data suggests nobody either goes beyond that top result they do, it saves them a lot of resources they can invest elsewhere rather than showing results for the sake of it. Do you not think that it's probably, based upon data, a good thing for users and users you know, are, are probably fairly happy with it. Um, the only people that would be unhappy about it are the people who perhaps got some traffic through those kind of keyword phrases and um, that's reduced. But also anti-competition lobbies um, or governments, um, departments, um, people like the EU. Do you think perhaps it was a mistake doing that because it maybe emphasised that, that Google is a bit more of a monopoly than, you know, um, a, 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 a single player within a, a marketplace of multiple search engines. No, I agree to an extent that on Google's behalf, it probably wasn't a good move for regards to the EU, um, especially since the FSA in Russia um, passed a ruling in favour of Yandex that they, Google has to produce a widget app. Um, allowing Android users to move over to other search engines a lot more easily. We know the EU is using that as a piece of precedent of Google being hit by an anti monopoly euro. Um, but if we look to other search engines, not just from Google, but if you look over um, to Korea with uh, Naver Dan, um, China with Baidu, organic search makes up a very small proportion of what their search results are. And like we see Yahoo! Um, now as being an aggregator, that's how they perform. On Baidu, um, a lot of their stuff comes from what we usually call rich snippets or feature snippets on Google, but it's um, things that you build within real web master tools or submit like Biker and Linyang. So it's not a format that doesn't exist already out there. Now, admittedly, the types of ba uh, Baidu neighbor are quite native to their specific countries. But they still hold a monopoly in most specific countries like Google does. Um, and at the same time, Google is a product. It isn't the internet as a whole. And there are alternative products out there. And I can remember growing up, Ask Jeeves used to run television adverts mm. constantly. And yeah. I remember going on Windows 98 and going to Ask Jeeves. And I don't know what I was Googling back up, 
or searching for, like, right? but um, I remember doing it. I remember using Bing. I remember AOL. I remember uh, I still know Just. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I can remember going through mm-hmm. those phases. And then I can remember Google coming up, similar to how I can remember Facebook taking over MySpace. The fact is, Google offered a much better product on yeah. an open, the internet is effectively open source. It offered a much better product. As users, we voted and decided in our numbers to use Google as a product, which is yeah. made it the monolith it is. End of the day, search isn't Google's primary function. They make money from AdWords. They make money from other sources. Search is almost the byproduct that gets people through the door because I can remember when Netscape first came about, when Yahoo got the directory listings in the nav bars. Again, it's that kind of phase. And if we are in a phase where Google is going to be tracked like a monopoly and it has going to have the answer monopoly things put on it, queries like this, I think, are a very weak argument. Um, the more focus should be on the travel queries, especially with things like Google Flight Aggregator and other Google shopping products. We've got um, Daniel um, on the Facebook page shouting out Lycos. We're trying to get the uh, the earliest possible search engine here. Um, I remember oh, seeing another s- story um, over, the, over the last week or so saying that um, it may even be a possibility that e- the EU could ask Google to disclose its algorithms so that companies can figure out how to rank <laughs> on there. And to me, that seems counterproductive because that would just be opening up the algorithm to spammers, surely. Yeah, no, completely. And at the end of the day, Google has gained its prominence by advancing the products it has, advancing the algorithms, taking a stance with things like Panda and Penguin, um, caffeine to speed things up by evolving to meet user needs, um, forcing HTTPS, privacy by design, by that responsiveness. It's all these things which, okay, they've caught some sites cold and they've damaged some businesses. Um, but ultimately, we've done it in favour of users, and it's that rapid advancement which has helped. So that if just Google takes like us. Um, sorry for cutting you off there, Dan. Though, um, no. did, <laughs> could you summarise what you're just about to say in ten seconds? Um, I forgot what I was about to say. But I was going to say <laughs> if it's asking Google to reveal this would be like asking Coca Cola or KFC to reveal the secret ingredients. It's oh. intellectual property that makes product a product. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Great point there. Um, so I was just going to say that it just about takes us um, up to the end of this, the, the fourth episode. So um, just time for an actionable tip from each of our guests. Um, so it doesn't have to be related to what we have been discussing in this episode. It could be something completely unique and different um, based upon what they do in their day-to-day lives. So Anu, first, um, what is your actionable tip? Um, my actionable tip is like something that I find to be a bit of a pet peeve when I'm uh, when I've bought a product from I've done some online shopping which I do a lot too much and um, and then when I brought the product that same product is retargeted to me and I think a lot of brands need to do a lot better of exclusion of different audiences I mean I think yeah we touched on audiences and that really just you know scream out in my head of like yeah we could do a lot more like audience exclusions a lot better and with you know having custom intent audiences that are coming up to YouTube and you know seeing things that we already um, have bought into we don't necessarily need to be retargeted with them you know another retargeted the same product so yeah just more clever retargeting and you know different messaging creative you know being creative with the different messaging that we do when we retarget the the audience so what you're basically saying is that retargeting is too cheap at the moment because brands can afford to just um, display it all the time so you're asking for google to charge more for retargeting (laughs) <laughs> in I mean, some other words maybe <laughs> <laughs> and you can find Anu over at mindswan.com so over to Dan now Dan what is your actionable tip sir so my actionable tip on this basically following on from this um, core algorithm update that has been one thing which has proven strong and that's brands and websites which have invested in basically the basics really well and played the long term game I've noticed have no negative um, repercussions or basically come from one scope where some competitors haven't. So whilst the focus is at the moment around things like security, uh, the mobile first index, and pages, whatever the new fancy thing might be, just don't neglect the basics. 
match content to user intent and keep structures on websites user friendly. And in the long run, you should see success with that as well as then adopting the new um, shiny things that um, everyone wants to do. Great advice. Stop being distracted by the big, um, bright, shiny things, unless, of course, you have um, your basics lined up correctly. So you can also find Dan over at cyber-scanner.com. So I've been your host, David Bain. You can also find me over at digitalmarketingradio.com. We will be recording the next episode, episode five of Search Marketing Scoop at the same time, same place, the SEM Rush Facebook page on Wednesday, the 4th of April, 2018 when my guests are scheduled to be David Miles from the PPC machine and Stephen Slater from Top Rank Marketing. In the meantime, thanks not only to Anu and Dan, but also to you for tuning up. So thanks for um, being a part of it. But until we meet again, be fantabulous and do one thing that scares you. Adios.